Hey guys, I am excited to be back in front of you. We are diving back into our Catching Fire series, our series in the book of Acts. But let me just kind of reiterate, wasn't last weekend amazing? It, we had an amazing time. Thanks again to all those that were instrumental in putting that together. We had a, a wonderful time. Now we're back in a series we are calling Catching Fire. It's how God ignited his church, as we see in the book of Acts, but we're going to say we are his church too. How God ignites his church to make an impact and win the world, change the world. So w before I do, I want to ask the question. You know we have uh, uh, that saying. We always say gospel, the gospel changes people and people change the world, right? So if I ask you, are you willing to let God ignite you to change the world, what would your answer be? Now, I, I asked that earlier, and you were in church, so the obvious answer is yes, right? Um, you, we're going to say yes because that sounds like that's what you should say. But I'm going to ask the question a different way, and I don't want you to answer this time. I just want you to think about it. Are you willing to let God ignite you to reach and change your country? How about your state? Are you up for God using you to be instrumental to bring about a change in your city? your neighborhood, your community, your subdivision, the, uh, the, the apartment building, your dorm, are you feeling the weight and the burden of God calling spirit-filled believers to make change and be his change agents, be his representatives, his conduits where you are? Now, this is not going to be, I hope it's not going to be one of those guilt messages where I say a bunch of things and you feel guilty, because that's not what my intention is. I want to pose the question, but I want you to evaluate that question and sit with that from Scripture. And let's, let's evaluate whether or not Scripture is telling us and commanding us to move in a certain way. And the way we're going to do this, we're going to track the life of one of God's obedient, spirit-filled servants in Scripture, Philip. We are calling this message contagious faith. Contagious faith. How God uses, God calls spirit-filled believers to spread the gospel. Now, last Saturday, during a sound check before our concert, Lecrae came in and he had a mask on his face. And I went to dap him up and he was like, no, 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 man, I, I, I got something, I've been dealing with something, and I don't want to infect, you know, anybody that I come in contact with. Uh, so we just kind of dapped on the shoulder. Now, you wouldn't have been able to tell that by the way he performed Saturday night, but he sure enough had this thing on his face. So I thought about that and I said, what it, would it be like for believers to be just that contagious with their joy, the joy of the gospel that anyone they come in contact with gets effect, infected or affected? That's what we see in Philip's life. Any place he gets assigned to, and we're going to track that here in just a second, the gospel is going forth. It's not optional. It's not if it's convenient for you. It's not, hey, well, let me take care of a few other things before I prioritize sharing my faith. Let me get through school, or let me, I got a big assignment on my job, or I have work responsibilities. Once that's over, then if I have some time, I will consider being used by God to reach other people. We're going to see that that's not how Philip approached how he, what he was hearing from God and the burden that he had. We will also see that Philip is being used to fulfill prophecy. Prophecy is being used by, prophecy is being fulfilled by Philip's obedience. Let's see if we can get in our text right now here. Um, the church is at a point in its history where it's being forced out. 
Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second, but let's just go to Scripture right now. I would like to bring your attention to John chapter 16. This is Jesus speaking, and let's start at the first verse, John chapter 16. This is before Jesus goes to the cross. He has this to say to his disciples. He says this, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I have told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember that I told them to you. Okay? This is Jesus talking to them saying, there's going to come a time where they're going to kick you out of your church. The synagogue that they grew up every Saturday going to, they knew the rabbis, the rabbis, you know, you know uh, uh, knew them from birth. These same rabbis, these same teachers were not going to let them come back to this church. They, they couldn't hardly believe, but Jesus is saying, no, I'm telling you this in advance. So you won't be surprised when it's happening. Let's kind of skip down. Let's read something else. Let's go down to the... Uh, let's go down to verse 12. Verse 12 says, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. Basically, he said, you can't handle the truth. But he says, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. Verse 14 says, he will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes what's from, he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. Skip down to verse 33. It says this. I have told you these things so that you may, that, that my, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. He said you will have suffering in this world. He's telling this before he even goes to the cross. But in that time, remember to be courageous because I have conquered the world the world. Jesus is speaking prophetically, but it's about to take place very shortly after he said these things to them. One other scripture. Let's, let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, and let's start at the sixth verse. Jesus has already been crucified and resurrected. Now he's making these appearance, appearances to them. This is the last time he's going to appear to them before he gets uh, pulled in a, before he ascends into heaven. Verse 6 says, Acts chapter 1, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? This is, this is how Jesus responds. He says, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father had set before, the Father had set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in all Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And he said this, and he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit has come on you, you will receive power to be my witness. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, and all Samaria, and even to the ends, even to the ends of the earth. Now the church is in the book of Acts. They have received the Holy Spirit. There's a lot going on. Peter's preaching boldly. The Sanhedrin is throwing them in jail, and the Holy Spirit is breaking them loose. And there's a lot of activity going on. We even have new leaders being raised up. You remember there was elected seven guys? Philip was one of those seven. There was also a guy named Stephen. Stephen was a mighty warrior in the faith. It says that Stephen was full of the spirit. Stephen was going around preaching boldly. Remember they prayed for boldness. 
he would get right in the face of the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders, and it's recorded where one time he started from Abraham and preached all the way up to Jesus and said, you rejected him. You crucified him. He called them stiff-necked. He just let them know that, hey, the one that the prophets had been prophesying about, about is, is, was here, and you rejected him. After they tolerated this enough, the Sanhedrin said, you know what, this is it. They covered their ears, and they bum-rushed him, and they dragged him to the edge of the city, and they stoned him. They couldn't take it anymore. They said, look, we'll just deal with the fallout later. We're going to get rid of this guy right now. Scripture reports that as they were stoning Stephen, he, he looks up towards heaven, and he sees his Savior, and he utters these words. He says, Father, don't hold this sin against them. While he was being stoned, while stones were bouncing off of his head, while he was on the ground, he said, Father, don't hold these sins against them. Where did he hear that? He heard that from Jesus. He heard his Savior say, so we see where Stephen's heart was. Stephen's heart was for, for this lost generation. Scripture also says is that while they were stoning Stephen, they took off their garments or their coats, and they laid them at the feet of a young man who was in attendance. His name was Saul. Saul, as we talked about before, was a disciple of Gamaliel. Saul was a Pharisee. He was given approval to all that was happening. So right after Stephen is executed, persecution broke out not just against the leaders of the church, but against all of the followers of Christ. So Saul, the religious leaders, they started going after the entire church. The entire church scattered. They are forced now out of Jerusalem. They find themselves seeking refuge in Judea and in Samaria because they are being forced due to the persecution. But as we know, as we just read, this is what Jesus prophesied would happen. Jesus said, the, you will have power. It was because of the persecution now that the believers find themselves in these regions. Philip found himself in Samaria. Now, uh, Samaria is that same town where Jesus encountered the woman at the well. You guys remember that story? And the lady was shocked that Jesus was actually even talking to her. The, the, the lady said, you know, you guys don't really rock with us that way. You don't deal with us. Why are you even talking to me? Because the Samaritans were thought of as half-breeds. They weren't really accepted as full, full Jews. But we find now Philip in Samaria, and scripture reports he's doing a mighty work. The Lord has endowed him now with new powers. Before we saw him as administrating the food distribution. Now, if we, if we read a chapter back, we see, or in the earlier in chapter 8, that he's being used to heal sick. He's casting out demons from people. He is sparking a movement. His faith is contagious now where he's being planted. This is where we pick up our text. This is where our text uh, jumps in, right in the midst of a mighty move. If you can get to 826, chapter 826, it even records before that that there was such a, such a movement taking place in Samaria. Peter and John heard about it, and they come to Samaria astonished. They was like, wow. They prayed for the Samarians, laid hands, and it says the Samarians received the Holy Spirit just like they had received. So now this is an electric time. It, revival is breaking out again in Samaria. And this is where we, we, we open up with our text here. Acts chapter 8, 26. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of the entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting 
in his chariot on the way back home reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. That was the custom. They would read aloud at the time. Verse 29 says, the spirit told Philip, go and join to that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? Here's how the Ethiopian eunuch responded. He says, how can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as the lamb silent before his shearers, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning from, with that very scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and they baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, though, appeared in Astos and was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. All right. Let's see if we can pull out a few observations of what just took place here and apply it to our lives as we are considering, hey, God, are you igniting me to change the world? Is my faith to be one that's contagious? And what would I experience if I really truly make, I truly make the decision to allow God to use me in the way he used this mighty man, Philip? Here's a few things that I, I would like to point out. God may use unpleasant circumstances to redirect his servants to different ministry assignments. God may use unpleasant circumstances to redirect his servants to different ministry assignments. Philip gets called from Samaria. He wasn't in Samaria because he wanted to be. He was in Samaria because he was running for his life. Saul was had orders, and Saul had permission to round up Christians and persecute them and throw them in jail. So he fled, and where he landed was Samaria, and he ended up ministering where he was. Some of us sitting here today, where we are right now in 2020 is not where we thought we would be in 2019 this time. Some of the New Year's resolutions you made in 2019, you are far from that in 2020. Some of you sitting in this very building, you would never thought you would be sitting in this building at this time. The situations that God have allowed to happen and come your way in your life could they be directing where he wants you to minister next? Or out of, could, it be, could it be building a new burden in you? Something that you didn't expect to happen, something that you rather had not happened, could that be creating a burden in you that God is actually putting in there to redirect you to where he wants you? Last year, this very time, I didn't think I would be here. I didn't think I would be preaching. I thought I would be playing back there, playing the bass, and it would be good. I have seen the Lord redirect me through circumstances just this past year. I would even say our ministry, we seek to be attentive to God's move. Our ministry, Blueprint Church, has been redirected because of some events that the Lord has brought right in front of us. This time last year, we were not looking to plant a campus. 
it wasn't even on the radar for, 20, for 2020. We weren't looking to do that. We, as a church, someone contacted us. We weren't looking. They said, hey, we have a property, a building, a campus with multiple buildings on it. We would like to give to Blueprint Church for the purpose of doing ministry because we see what you guys are doing in the old fourth ward. And we was like, yeah, right, you won't give us a church, right? You know, nobody gives a church away. This is a nice campus. It's valued for over a million and a half dollars. And they said, here, we want you to do ministry in it. We were leery at first. The elders were like, eh, what's this? where are the strings? Fast forward, we now own that property. And guess what? There's no debt on it. We are in possession of a ministry tool that the Lord has placed in our possession so that we could spread the gospel. And we said, okay, Lord, if you're giving us this, you are speaking. This is your voice speaking. If you're giving us tools, we want to maximize these tools. Now, we even reached out to the congregation that was already in that building and said, look, we want to get to know you, we want to love you, and we want you to come alongside, and we come alongside you, and we minister and labor in the gospel together. We didn't see that last year. That wasn't even on our radar. But the Lord is using situations and circumstances to redirect us to where he wants us to minister. Here's something else. If we are going to experience the obedience uh, the, we're going to be obedient to the call of ministry like Philip was, God may call us to leave what's familiar and comfortable or even gratifying. God may call us to leave our comfort zone. Philip was building with the Samaritan people. There was, there was a movement taking place. He had, didn't know he was going to be there. Now he's there. Souls are coming to know Jesus. Evil spirits are being cast out. Um, God is using him mightily to build a thriving church in Samaria. And when he gets this call, okay, now I want you to go down to the desert. If someone would have asked Philip, okay, Philip, what are you going to do when you get down there? He wouldn't have had an answer. Okay, who's, who, who's going to be down there? Philip wouldn't have had an answer because he wasn't told. What he was told was go down to the desert on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. Brings me to my next point. God is requiring obedience to step one before he reveals step two. God knew that his servant Philip was going to be obedient to step one. Philip. Philip goes down, and Philip goes down to this road, and I don't know if the the eunuch was coming by just as he got there or if there was some time he had to wait. If If God operates the way he does in my life, there's always a little bit of time between step one and step two. Is anyone experienced that? Where your faith gets challenged, where, okay, Lord, I heard you say step one, Now, where's step two? And I have to just wait and anchor down on, okay, the Lord has this under control. The Lord has this timing under control. So therefore, let me just be secure in what he's already told me to do and be where he's told me to be, even if it doesn't look like anything is happening. How about this? God's call will require a new level of faith. God's going to use Philip in a different way than he has been using him. He has an assignment down here on this desert road. He doesn't know what the assignment is. We know what the assignment is. He was to meet an Ethiopian eunuch. That was the assignment that Philip had. So let's talk a little bit about the Ethiopian eunuch. The the, it says here that the eunuch was traveling back from Jerusalem, and he was worshiping in Jerusalem. Uh, he was a proselyte. He adhered to the Jewish faith, although he wasn't by birth a Jew. He, he was what they would call a God-fearing, a God-fearer. But he could never fully be accepted 
because of his ethnicity and also the fact that he was a eunuch. A eunuch, because of his position uh, as uh, an official for the queen, had to be castrated. So his genitals were castrated. Therefore, he could never meet the requirements that the, the, the authentic Jews would put on him of being circumcised. So he would never fully feel like he's accepted into their family because of what has happened in his life and his position and because the, st the status. But what it says that he was studying the scripture, he still had a hunger for God's word. He was reading Isaiah. A long trip, he had a long time to read Isaiah. I did some studying, it's uh, approximately 1,600 miles between Jerusalem and Ethiopia. To put that in perspective, it's about that distance between here and North Dakota. Anybody know where North Dakota is? <laughs> it's right above South Dakota. It borders Canada. It's a long, it's about a mid, Midwest state. It borders Canada. It's a long ways away, especially on chariot. He was riding along, reading the book of Isaiah aloud. That was the custom. It wasn't, it wasn't weird that he was reading it out loud. He was reading it. But God had an assignment, an intersection already planned. Um, God wanted Philip to intersect with this, this eunuch. Now, Scripture doesn't name this eunuch, but can I give him a name? Um, let's call him Eddie, all right? So Eddie the Ethiopian was riding along, and as this chariot is moving, Philip sees the chariot, and then he gets instruction number two, go join to the chariot. So this chariot is moving along. Philip starts running. He goes and he joins to this, this chariot. And he didn't know what this man was going to say, if this man was going to be accepting of him. But he knew that, hey, if the Holy Spirit is telling me to go, the Holy Spirit must want, he must want me to minister to this unit. Brings me to my next point. God might already have your ministry assignment headed your way. The ministry assignment God wants you to intersect with could already be headed in your direction. Therefore, be prepared to respond as soon as God says go. How do I prepare myself to respond when God says go? by familiarizing myself with what God has already said in his word through scripture, by spending time in prayer, by being attentive and cultivating an ear to hear the Holy Spirit, knowing that, hey, this is my call. This is my commission. My commission is to be about having contagious faith and being a conduit and being an ambassador and being a, a minister of reconciliation. I already know that. So when the call comes, I move knowing that. Okay? How about this? There is no small assignment from God. There is no small assignment from God. Philip leaves this bustling church where people are getting delivered, saved, sick are getting healed, People are coming into relationship with Jesus Christ. It's exciting. They are no longer half-breed Sumerians. They are now fully accepted by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's building relationships with them. And the Lord says, leave there to go minister to one guy. But Lord, I got this big congregation growing. It's popping right now. Can I send somebody else? How about I train somebody else and send them? No. The Lord says, you, Philip, go and now we see his assignment is to minister to one man. How about this as a point? Where God wants to use you may look like a desert. Where God wants to use you for your next assignment may look like a desert. May, may not look like a lot is happening there yet. May not look as if it's 
thriving. Legend has it that after Philip ministers to this eunuch, he goes and he shares this gospel at his country and revival breaks out where he's from. But we see in scripture that right after Eddie was baptized, the Holy Spirit brings them out the water and just almost like supernaturally teleports Philip away. They come up out the water, he rubs his eyes, and Philip is gone. Where did Philip go? The, the, the scripture says he takes him to a whole nother city and just plops him there. Boom. This wasn't even on Philip's radar. He didn't even know he was going to that city. So now his assignment has just changed again. What does he do? I'm in the city. I didn't know. I didn't plan to go here. Now what do I do? He, 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 he does what he's been doing the whole time. He starts ministering. And scripture says he started ministering to all of the towns all the way to Caesarea because that was, that's what was in him. He was contagious. Anybody he came in contact with would get infected by this joy that he had inside of him. As we read on through Acts, we sort of lose track of Philip uh, because when we go into chapter 9, you don't hear anything else about Philip. And when you go into 10, 11, 12, Philip isn't present. He, he sort of just kind of fades away. So in studying this this week with uh, Pastor Wesley, we started going on a hunt. What happened to Philip? What happened to Philip? A lot started happening because in chapter 9, we're going to get uh, to the, an assignment that the Lord gives another one of his servants, Ananias. And that assignment is to go minister to Saul. And we're going to w- walk through Saul's conversion. But Philip sort of disappears. But my soul was happy when we found a mention of Philip in Acts chapter 21. And I want to put that on the screen. Here's where Philip reappears from chapter 8. He reappears in chapter 21. It says, when we completed our voyage from Tyra, we were in Potemius, We were greeted by the brothers and the sisters and stayed with them for a day. This is now the converted Saul, Paul speaking. This is Paul saying this. And he says, the next day we left and we came to Caesarea where we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. How amazing is that? We know this is the same Philip because it says he was one of the seven that was chosen earlier on in Acts. The converted Paul now seeks out and he goes and stays with Philip, the same guy Philip was running from. Philip fleed to Samaria because Saul was going to kill him. Saul was chasing them. Now we see it come back full circle where the two are now brothers in Christ and they're enjoying fellowship. It even says, as we find Philip again, it says that this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So he was raising a family and he was continuing the work that we saw him doing way back in chapter 8. It's contagious it continues just to spill over and touch all that he came in contact with. So I want to conclude this message this way. Last week, as I said, was an amazing week. During the week, I was in a conversation with one of our members who said this. This member said, man, it was such a great weekend and even impactful to see the documentary of what took place over the last 10 years and how God moved and caused people to make sacrifice, and, but they were rewarded because they saw the gospel go forth. And this person said, you know, that was an exciting time. I wish that I was a part of the church during that time and experienced God moving that way and growing faith and doing, doing things in the life of Blueprint. It was almost as, with, almost as if they felt like they were missing out because they just didn't experience all of the things that was uh, just talked about in that documentary. And I started thinking about that. 
And, this, and, and the Lord kind of shared this with me. The Lord said, well, Rob, I'm doing the same thing now in the life of Blueprint. There is work happening right now. The 2030 documentary is being written right now. There are things going on in our body. There are people being ministered to. The Lord is reassigning saints and igniting passion in people's heart right now to add to the 2030 documentary. But more importantly, souls are being added to the kingdom. And the gospel is spreading. We talked about uh, the ministry for Stone Mountain, Georgia campus. Yesterday, um, Pastor Corwin and I had uh, the privilege and an opportunity to minister to over 100 elementary students in a elementary school half a mile away from that church's campus. Um, we were able to serve them breakfast as they prepared for their Saturday school. And we're standing there, and we could see some of the looks on the faces of the staff of teachers that came to minister and teach the kids. Some of the staff knew us because we've been frequenting the building, but other ones are like, who are these guys? And why, why are these guys here? And the parents would come and drop off their children, and they would see us, and they kind of had, okay, are these security? Why are these guys here? Right? And we, we have made it very explicit to the, the staff at the school that we talked to that we have an ulterior motive. The reason we are coming alongside you guys and serving your needs is because we want an opportunity to show the love of Christ to you. That's why we're doing it. There's, there's no hidden agenda. We want it to be known right now that that's why we are serving you guys, because love has been shown to us, and we want an opportunity to show love to the staff and even the parents and even the students. As we accept our ministry assignment in Stone Mountain, I am asking those that are in the east side of Atlanta, in our city groups, to pray, to see what the Lord is saying to you about joining us in that assignment. There's work to be done. There's exciting work. Now, I was here for the last 10 years, and although there was some smiles and laughs and a lot of nostalgia over the, in that video, it was tough sometimes. There was a lot of stress in these 10 years. The Lord would have us in meetings and sometimes we didn't agree. Or the Lord would bring opportunities and we had an opportunity to go before the Lord and decide, hey, is this the way the Lord is leading or, or is he leading that way? I remember even when we, um, before we got this building, we were about to sign a, they wanted us to sign a 10 year lease on a building that was about the third of this size. And we couldn't find another building and we were considering it. And then the Lord brought this building. Uh, it was in the latter part of the year. And I remember them saying, yeah, but here's the catch. You're going to have to take possession and be in it before the year is out. We was like, okay. We came and we watched God do something. And now we're seeing a building three times as big as where we were being filled up for two services a Sunday. And we are believing that as we launch our church, the Lord is going to continue to fill this building up. We are watching God do his work just like he did for, from Plumline, just like he did in the book of Acts. And we are excited to be a part of what God is doing. It is going to require spirit-filled believers who possess some of the same things that we talked about, being willing to be reassigned being willing to step out of your comfort zone, being willing to say, I am going to prioritize the spreading of the gospel over my preference or just me being comfortable where I am. We are called to do that. Just like the Ethiopian didn't feel connected he had the scriptures, he just felt like, I'm never going to be accepted. He felt like, I need someone to explain this to me, and the best I can do is just try to understand what this says. He didn't know that before that day was out, 
he was going to have a personal relationship with the Savior. And he was going to be fully accepted into the kingdom of God. We have an opportunity to share that message here in the Old Fourth Ward and in Stone Mountain. There's an assignment that could be headed our way wherever we are. Our response should be, if the Lord is telling us to be prepared and to go, to come in contact with that assignment and allow, as Jesus prophesied, the power of the Spirit to endow us to be his witnesses, to endow us to minister and share the love of Christ. We are writing the next documentary right now. But God is going to get the glory because we're going to see souls impacted, saints edified, and his work is going to go forth. That's what we're called to do. Let's now, we, we rejoice in what has taken place. Let's continue to do what God has called us to do. Amen? Let's pray. We hope this message encouraged you today. To support our ministry through giving or to stay up to date with what's going on at Blueprint Church, you can visit our website at blueprintchurch.org. You can also follow us on social media at Blueprint Church. Thanks, everyone. Grace and peace. Thank you.